All right, we are live. Welcome. Welcome, everyone. Appreciate you coming by. This is my name is Dan, and I am the host of the Aquarium Insider podcast. And today I'm doing kind of a little solo broadcast, and I wanted to do I wanted to talk about this for a while. And this is going to be, I'll probably cover this topic a uh, several, several times uh, throughout the the life of this show, I guess. But the first thing we've never talked about, I haven't talked about this on my YouTube channel or on this podcast, and that is um, water quality. So I kind of wanted to just do just a quick brief overview. If you're just getting the hobby, talk about what water quality is, why it's important for you and some things to look out for, uh, when you're first starting to set up these tanks without trying to get overly complicated and, and, and sort of advanced. I want this to be like the beginner's point, start here, learn from these points on what to look at and why you're having issues. And then you can kind of troubleshoot back from there. So, for water quality for you know from my perspective is 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 the most important possible thing so in a commercial setting and a lot of times like we run them we're running real high density culture systems and what i mean by that is we're running a lot of fish in a, in a small tank and a smaller not really small tank but smaller system or smaller environment because it's short term right and we're trying to maximize our space and it's not a long term solution right this is this is a production setting on a farm right? Or a holding tank for a wholesaler. We do both, right? We're, a, I, it's weird because I try to put all my different hats on. We're, we're a lot of different parts of the supply chain. So we are a full commercial fish farm where we have a, uh, seven acre farm with earthen ponds with lots of fish in those like live bears, different types of haps, you know, just a real gamut of stuff. Then we have a whole inside production, of uh, fish that are a little bit more sensitive to water. We do a ton of angels. We do severums. We're working on frontosa. Uh, we did betas for a while. Um, we're doing, we did some guppy strains for a little bit. We did, and then we, you know, have some other stuff in there. We grow out where we don't breed it ourselves, but we'll buy it super small and we'll grow it up because it's a good fish for us. Or we can find quality better than we can do ourselves elsewhere. And maybe that's another topic for another day, but just some ideas of like, where I'm coming from and how important water quality is. Because if it's important for us on this scale, it's in, it's no different than any aquarist looking to uh, start up an aquarium. So you know, my first question of this whole podcast is just like, you know, why does it matter to you? So for us and for you too, it should be the starting point and end point for how you're checking the health of the fish. These are the water quality parameters you can check and, and kind of monitor is going to give you a good indicator if there is something wrong or a precursor to something going wrong. Uh, a lot of times, you know, I'm not, it's not the end all be all perfect solution, but it definitely is a great indicator of how that's going to work for you. So if you're just getting you like, my God, I don't want to get over overwhelmed with all the different water quality components and all the different things. No sweat. We're going to briefly talk about each um, and you can buy them and test them very simply with test strips and in, in and uh, the API master kit, and it's a very simple step-by-step -step direction. It's just a few drops in some water. You tilt the, you tilt your little, um, you tilt. Words are hard. You just, oh God, it's late. Sorry, I've been working all day, and I decided to record this. It's, I think it's eleven o'clock. I'm I'm a little tired, but I wanted to get the podcast out. I didn't want to miss it. So um, anyway, you just you you literally put a few drops in your little vial, and then you just move it up and down, and you'll get a different color. And you just read the color chart. And we're gonna talk about what those numbers mean today. So a lot of roundabout ways to go about that. So let's kind of go ahead and dive into sort of the most important parts of water quality. Now, before I talk about the specific parameters, two things to mention that, are, that should be super important to you. Before you start, you really need to know the water parameters of your source water. And I say that is because that's going to tell you a lot of times where the beginning point for your fish keeping could begin and should begin, Right. And then if you are going to make adjustments, you can base it off of your source water. And because not, you know, maybe you know this or not, but not all fish come to the same types of water quality parameters. We can have fish that are real soft water species that come out of the Amazon, the Rio de Negro, right? Or we can have fish that come out of Lake Malawi in such hard water. And those are two vastly different environments. So we need to start thinking about you know, that and relating it back to our source water as best I can, as best you can. Right. And then number two, I would always try to get fish locally to me first when you're first starting out. And the main reason is 
they're going to have fish that are related. Oh, sorry, not related that are in, I would hope similar water to yours. That could be your local pet store. You could get them at your local club meetings, stuff like that is a good starting point for getting fish because, and then you should know your fish should be either adapted pretty well, hopefully, and, uh, can, are doing well and acclimated well in that level of, um, your level of water quality parameters. So it's a little bit easier to maintain to start with. You're not, you know, sh chasing water quality. Cause that's one, that's probably my number one rule for most aquarists out there is don't chase, you know, water quality parameters for the most perfect everything. I don't think that's helpful. And I think you go through a lot of money buying stabilizers and pH downs and pH ups and everything in the world. I'm not saying you can't cause in, I did this video. I talk about it might be necessary for you in certain cases because not everyone water quality in the whole country is you know the same. But generally speaking, I try not to chase water quality parameters. All right, so let's kind of break down the different water quality parameters we're going to talk about. So the first one, and this is the most you know obviously one of the most important factors out there, and this is one you can't test for, and it's oxygen. You're like, Dan. Oxygen, really? There's water. Uh, wh what are you talking about? There's oxygen in the water. Is fish breathe out. How does that work? What does it look like? You know, a real brief overview. Fish breathe through a process called diffusion where they're, you know, to make it simple, they're pulling oxygen out of the water and either breathe and move oxygen amount around their body to get oxygen where they need it, right? That's a very simplistic way of explaining it, and that's how we'll leave it for now. But your fish need it to survive. So how would you measure it? Well, one, unless you're a commercial operation like us where we have access to those tools, you're not going to be. So why is it important to you? Here's the number one reason it's important. You don't need a measuring kit to know. You won't get to know if it's if it's at the appropriate level. What you will be able to do is identify if there is a problem with your oxygen levels. So here is some here's a quick couple identifying factors in your tank if you're looking at them and you're looking at your tank and your fish, how you can tell the oxygen might be low. So first off, your fish are starting to huddle around an air stone, right? You have an air bubbler in your tank, or you have maybe water trickling from your hang on back. You have water coming in the tank from one of your, you know, little flow pipes, whatever it is. The fish are huddled around that, right? That should be your tell, your number one telltale sign that there's probably an oxygen issue in your tank. Okay, these fish aren't getting oxygen like that. What else can you see? You'll see gulping or gasping at the surface, at the fish. And it's not like this is super common, but if it comes up, you're not going to know what to do. And maybe this will help guide you through that process. So gulping at the surface, gasping at the surface, huddle around an air stone, huddle around the top of a hang on back where they're just not getting the oxygen they need. How does that even happen in a fish tank? How can water not have oxygen already in it? It's right. Water is made up of H2O. Does that make sense? Here's a couple examples as to how that could happen. So the the number one, I would think this is probably more common than ever. If you live on a on a and you have a well property where you have well water, most times untreated well water without any sort of you know filtration systems at the well, degassing systems, things like that. Most of the time, that water is going to is going to come with very very low oxygen. And just to put it in perspective on a number scale, if you want to be super nerdy about it and want to figure out what those numbers look like, generally speaking, three PPM and under is about what your oxygen level comes out of the well. A lot of times uh, in untreated circumstances, not always, but a lot of the times, right? Uh, life really needs above five, maybe to eight, at least to be really sustainable. And then also think about it from a nitrogen cycle perspective, your bacteria that's going to deal with all of your, bad stuff in your tank, your, which we talk about here in a moment, your ammonia, your nitrite, your nitrates, right? Um, it needs at least two to three PPM. Uh, no, I'm sorry, four PPM, two to four PPM at least to survive and, and keep digesting and dealing with all of your ammonia issues, right? So that's super required. So something to think about when you're looking at and trying to diagnose maybe a few issues in your tank. All right. The next possible um, reason your fish could be gasping at the surface, you're like, well, they're still doing that, but I don't live on a well. Sometimes, and it's as, uh, this is one of the rarer cases, 
if your if your nitrogen cycle gets broken, which we are gonna, I'm gonna break that down a little bit more here in just a minute. But you have, you know, three parts of your nitrogen cycle. You have your ammonia, you have your nitrite, and you have your nitrate. Ammonia is toxic to fish. Nitrite is very toxic to fish. Nitrite in high concentrations can cause uh, what's called brown blood disease. It basically doesn't allow the fish to absorb oxygen and causes them not to be able to really breathe, to make it simplistic. Maybe In another podcast I have planned, we're going to do an advanced breakdown of all these different components and, and what it really looks like on, the, on a more, I don't say molecular level, but a more advanced level, we'll say. So it'll stop them from being able to breathe effectively. So you'll see that gulping, that gasping, that huddle around the air stone type thing. So, you know, the biggest question I would say is like, okay, Dan, I see this in my tank. What can I possibly do? There's a few things you can do that have been effective that I've used over the time. First, first things first, if, if you live on the well, that might be a separate issue. If it was me and I lived on a well and I'm having that issue, I would always let my well water sit at least a good day, best practice two days. Just let it sit before, like in a container, uh, a garbage can or something, right? In a in something next to your fish tank. And then let that sit before you're going to use that as your water change water. We'll start with that. Number two, if you can, put a really good bubbler system in there with really fine bubbles. So I would always let my water sit ahead of time with uh, well here we use a very commercial i i, I call it a very low-tech uh degassing system which i don't want to break too much into but if you're at home need something easy to use a garbage can and a bubbler with some fine bubbles in it and let the water sit for a couple days before you're going to do your water change right always have water on hand for that sort of thing so that'll that will help eliminate right that problem from having happening again right if you're having it because your nitrogen cycle is breaking down, like your nitrites happen to spike, and you're like, what, this happened out of nowhere? You're going to have to find the cause of that problem. Because if I could tell you just to do a water change, that's going to simplistically help you in the short term, which will help, right? But the downside is it might not help you in the long term. You might end up causing even more issues and more crashes and more things. So we need to start reevaluating what that looks like in our aquarium. Do I have an enormous amount of fish in this tank? Do I have the proper filtration set up? Have I cleaned the substrate lately? Have I done any major water changes at all recently, right? So some different things could cause that to happen. And just make sure you're checking off all those boxes. And definitely, you're still going to do the water change immediately for this thing, right? Immediately. And um, I haven't broken it down for for um aquariums but i'm doing it in my head kind of just on the spot here if you don't have fish that are sensitive to salt using aquarium salt will help negate some of the um problems um for the nitrite poisoning and um i'm thinking in my head what you would want to do it, it would depend on the level of nitrite toxicity but essentially I would shoot for, and this is a very hard way to explain because I'm not going to be able to break it down in super short terms. I would try to, if you have fish that are sensitive to salt, and I would definitely research that first if you don't know. Um, if they're not sensitive to salt, I would use um, five grams of salt per liter of water in your aquarium. I know that's really weird and very metricy. But that's the kind of solution I use if it was in the short term and I had to deal with my nitrite issues. There is a better formula. Maybe I'll put a better, a more research document in the show notes of how you can find how to deal with it. Again, the paper I'm going to show you is going to be at a large scale on a farm basis. And you can break that down into gallons uh, and break it down even smaller for you in, in the home aquaria. But that's typically the ratio I've been using and had good success with. But, but, it's really dependent on those fish being not sensitive to salts, right? So any of your low, your low pH fish, your soft water fish, I wouldn't use it for. It typically, is gonna, it's going to really play well into your hardier fish, your hardier cichlids, your Africans, your Ameri your, most of your American cichlids. As long as they're not wild caught, it's going to be play with good. It's going to play good with your live bears, stuff, live bears and stuff like that. So maybe we avoid that for right now, and I break that down in another video, but Generally speaking, those are my two big methods to deal with um, oxygen issues. 
All right, next uh, next thing you want to be uh, concerned with, and while we're not really testing for it, you should have something in your aquarium to test uh, that would show you the reading, and that is a heater. <laughs> for most of your aquariums, you're going to need a heater in it at some level. A lot of your aquarium, very few of your aquarium fish are actually cold water, uh, meaning they like temperatures maybe under 70. 65, I think, is the real definition of cold water fish. Um, but you're going to need a heater in those tanks. And the main reason is temperature, as far as for fish go, is your most limiting factor in all of fish. And what I mean by that is temperature controls everything that fish does, right? Um, temperature, because fish are what you call ectothermic, meaning they get their body temperature from the surrounding water on the outside. So if you have a very tropical fish and that temperature starts getting colder, it's going gonna, it's gonna to affect how they move how much they eat, how much they respirate, uh, if they reproduce or don't. Um, it's going to impact, in fact, all of those different fish's physiological responses to that. Now, when can temperature be a problem? It's going to range a lot on your fish. So I'll give you a couple examples and kind of give you the spectrum, and you can kind of fit your fish on where you feel they might be. If you have very sensitive fish, and if you are one of these sensitive fish keepers, you already know this. It's not, this is not something I'm saying it's anything different. If you want to keep discus super high end, you want to keep rams, apistos, things like that, you better bring the heat, literally. <laughs> uh, they typically will start getting what you call thermal stress. Uh, and, and anything that's like a two to three degree, two to three degree fluctuation. And that could be just as simple as your house heating and cooling, right? So two to three degrees can start thermal stress on most fish. And I would say that affects a lot of your more sensitive fish. So that, so that could be, if your water temperature is going to drop below 75, that's definitely going to be impacting your smaller, quicker fish. A lot of times your neons, your cardinals sometimes can be affected by that. Definitely discus. And like I said, a lot of your rams, a lot of your pistos, things like that will be affected by it. I'm sure there's a gazillion more, but those are the ones I have the most experience with and seeing it. Um, and then the rest of your fish can still have that effect and have issues. Um, they're just typically a lot. It's going to have to happen a lot more often for it to cause that could be causing a disease issue, right? Because when that temperature starts fluctuating, you could any of them could have issues, but those are the most sensitive, right? And then your your African cichlids and things like that are a lot more hardy. They can tolerate the swings a lot better in in most cases. So in just what I've seen, I mean, I had Africans on on a I had a heater go out on a weekend when no one's available to work and get parts for things where the temperature got down to 68 degrees. Um, and I didn't lose any Africans. Um, I was very fortunate. Um, it happened when maybe like eight years ago or something. I had a whole greenhouse full of Africans and, uh, uh, one of my control units on my heater, uh, I had a big propane blower at the time and, uh, that's what we're using to heat it. It was a greenhouse style building. And uh, it went out. Couldn't, it was a whole CPU board, and I couldn't get a part. You can't get that part overnight, so I'm stressing. So we went and got some emergency sort of like propane blowers just to kind of keep the chill off the water and just dealt with it that way. And uh, it worked. It's, the water still got to like 68, and there's nothing I can – just nothing you can do about it at that point. So – but they tolerate it. They dealt with it. And I'm not saying it's going to be like that way for everything, but I was – maybe I was just fortunate and lucky, you know. Mm -hmm. So and keep an eye on me for that. So that that was, you know, one way I've seen African cichlids tolerate that swing. I would never want them to do that, you know, um, naturally. Surely putting any more stress you cause the fish is going to cause issues. But luckily for me, that didn't happen that way. So what are some good ways to prevent sort of this thermal stress or this really fluctuating in, in temperature? Well, I mean – You'll hear me talk about this on the podcast, but a lot of people might actually heat their room. A lot of people won't actually put heaters in the tanks, but they'll keep their general fish room at a certain temperature, and it's consistent. And I guess I should mention that consistency is just as important as temperature. If you happen to dip a little bit lower and your fish are pretty hardy, but it's a consistent temperature, I think that's actually pretty good too. It's the problem of when the, the tank, the temperatures start doing the huge fluctuations. That's more of a cause problem, I think. And now, mind you, if you're dropping in the 68-degree realm, I don't know if it's going to be helpful for a lot of fish. I'm sure a lot of fish could tolerate it, but it's a, the swings and making sure things are super consistent. 
I think is definitely your general key. Now, if you're not heating the room and you're heating your tank, what are some ways you could help manage it? Obviously, if you have a heater and tank, the easiest way is to put a lid on it. You know, keep a lid on your tank. One, that's going to help you with evaporation. And two, it's going to help maintain a, a heated tank with a better integrity, right? You're not worried about as much as the temperature uh, of your room changing as much. So that's the easiest way to kind of maintain your temperature. All right, let's get into the big ones, the nitrogen cycle. So let's talk about ammonia. So what is ammonia for your fish tank? Well, ammonia essentially is, is a byproduct of your fish or even a lot of times your leftover food will break down into ammonia that gets mostly excreted or re released out of the fish's gills. That's where most of the ammonia comes from, right? And uh, this byproduct um, essentially is toxic to fish, right? And think about your tank being a toilet bowl, right? If we all were in a room together and there was no toilet and we all had to go to the bathroom, it's kind of a gross, gross, <laughs> gross way to describe it, right? Uh, we had to go to the bathroom, we just go to the corner or something, right? But eventually over time, if there's no way to remove any of that stuff, it just builds up in the corner and it's really gross, so what do fish do and how do they deal with it? And that's where the nitrogen cycle comes in. We have little good bacteria guys out there, guys and girls that are just breaking down and breaking that ammonia down into um, something each time a little less toxic. So your ammonia or your total ammonia is toxic to fish um, and as far as your toxicity level. Because you'll if you have an a, like an API test kit or a test, you know, one of the little test strips from one of the companies out there, what levels are considered toxic to fish? This is also going to range based on the sensitivity of your fish. Some fish can't tolerate hardly any ammonia. Some fish are very tolerant of a lot of ammonia. Sometimes it's based on size and hardiness, you know, to give you a, a wide range of examples, right? If you want to put ammonia in a tank with something like a ram, you know, some of those softer water fish, eh, you're not going to have a whole lot of success. They're getting a little stressed out. You put that in a tank, and this is not an aquarium fish, but I've seen tilapia go in water as high uh, ammonia. I think it was like, like almost five or six, which that is very high for a lot of fish. And maybe in tilapia farms, it's probably like 10 to 12. And, um, not to get off topic too much, but um, we're working on what they call a bioflock system, which was trying to create a self-sustaining uh, tank or culture where there would be floating algae clusters where the fish could feed themselves uh, with the algae from the um, byproduct of waste and addition of uh, some different ingredients. So anyway, maybe I'll talk about that at a different podcast. But essentially, for our purposes, um, it's just going to depend on the sensitivity of your fish. But I would say... Point two. So if you're reading a lot of the, like, let's talk about the API test kit for a minute. And this is my, my take on the more retail water quality test kits. A lot of them don't have the ability to test incredibly accurate, right? They're, so to give you an idea, the API test kits like from zero to 0 0.25, right? There's no in between. Well, in between, it could be a big difference for your fish. At 0 0.25 is pretty bad a lot of times. The problem with that is, and I don't know if it was by design or not, your, your test kit's going to test positive. Anything going to be, I don't know what the threshold is, but I bet it's probably over 0 0.02, 0 0.03, and it's going to read out like it's a 0 0.25. Maybe I'll reach out to API to get some clarification on when it picks up the read or not, but um, it's going to show it's 0 0.25. And is it at 0 0.25? I don't have a good conclusive answer on that. But we if we just take it at face value and say, okay, my water is at 0.25, what can I do to lower my ammonia? Right? We, we go back to my original question. We need to figure out why our ammonia is high, and then we need to figure out a longer-term solution. It could just be as much as maybe uh, you started a brand-new tank and your cycle starting to go up, right? You, if you start a brand-new tank um, for your aquarium, you could easily have um, some higher ammonia in the beginning, and you just need to do a water change, right? Not a big deal. Not a real big deal at all. If you are, have a really established tank and you're starting to see 0.25 and your fish looking a little weary, um, I would be concerned your bio load's a little high for the aquarium you have, and maybe that's just something you look at and be like, how many fish do I have in this 
size tank. And maybe those fish have gotten bigger over the last, you know, the next year or two. And there's a bunch of them. Maybe your filtration could be inadequate, inadequate now because you have bigger fish in the same size aquarium. All those sorts of things play into a role. And I, it's hard to give an exact answer for that, but essentially what you need to look at is bio load and how, how many fish on your aquarium and what size are they? Are they big? Do you have, you know, um, what's a good example? You have 25 inch and a half fish in a 20 gallon tank, you know, or now they got to three inches. You know, that's going to definitely vary your water quality. And then, you, you know, like I said, how good is your filtration? What kind of filtration do you have? Do you have a complete filter? Uh, and I did a video on filters to make sure you have the things necessary to properly filter your aquarium, right? Uh, to do that, you, you know, I won't talk about too much, but just a brief thing. If you haven't seen this podcast before, I'll put a card up to the, to the video or something here, but, um, you need a mechanical filter that essentially removes all the stuff you can see. Typically it's food, it's waste. It could be food particles in the water and stuff like that. Then you need a filter that re can remove stuff you can't see. And this is the nitrogen cycle, like we're talking about, right? You need those things. And then if you want to, and I think it's absolutely a great thing to add and it's a chemical filter a uh, chemical filter will also help remove all some extra toxins and things out of the water that are definitely be aiding your other filters so those are the three types i think every filter should have um they should just have those right all right so we did briefly talk about this earlier but now we've talked about ammonia let's go ahead and talk about you the next stage so i have ammonia and now I've got my good bacteria and I don't know if the science is out on like what type they were, but I just remember old school. It was like ammonia and you have nitrous ammonas deal with that. I don't know if that's the same. I don't know if it's actually the science is, is, is different now or not, but anyway, you have a good bacteria that breaks down ammonia into nitrite, right? And then you have nitrite which, in your fish, which is still toxic to fish. It's just a little different type of toxicity now in your aquarium. And now we have this in your aquarium and you have a test kit. And if you have an API or a test strip or something like that, if you have an API kit, it's going to be really easy to tell. Either your water is like a light blue or it's some shade of purple, right? So typically what I tell people is if your nitrite is anything that's, uh, anything that's not blue, you got a problem and you need to deal with it. Um, depending on the degree of purple, and this goes back to my original um, problem in the beginning talking with talking about ammonia is – I'm not sure where the cutoff in between the different number segments are that it would read to the next number it, in the in nitrite. I think to me is the bigger issue here because nitrite is toxic to fish, especially aquarium fish in smaller concentrations. So it's still got a scale of what is it? 0 0.25, 0 0.5. I forgot the exact scale because I don't, I don't use that scale here in, in the farm. We're using um, a commercial farm kit. But I think it's like 0 0.25, 0 0.5, same sort of scale. Well, those things in that level are way more harmful to fish, way, way, way more toxic to fish. So I'm not sure the accuracy of the nitrite test is really that applicable to you. It's more scary. To me, it, it'd be more scary than anything. And it would, be, it would be very noticeable if you had really high nitrites in your tank. Your fish would be acting funny. If, you're at, if your tank's at a 0.5 of nitrite, your fish are going to be acting weird unless they're like real, real big cichlids and they're real hardy fish. You've got that predator tank with freaking peacock bass and Oscars and stuff like that. They probably wouldn't even notice it, but those smaller fish, they're going to notice that and your fish are going to be noticeably acting funny. So I don't know the answer. I, I hate to say this, but I can't give you an exact answer for that, but I can tell you how I would identify the problem. And that's kind of the key. That's kind of the point of this, right? You have these high things. What do you do? And essentially, it's the same thing across the board for uh, all of always ammonia. You have a, if you have a high nitrite problem, you have a broken cycle somehow. Did you wash out too much of your biofilter media? Hopefully, you had some, right? Did you wash too much of it out, and now your cycle is trying to catch back up, and you've got all these fish in your aquarium after time, right? Um, did you add a bunch of new fish into the aquarium, and it wasn't built up and, and dealt with enough? Right. So knowing your stocking density or a bio load in the tank is very, very crucial to knowing if your filter is actually big enough to handle it. And if it's me, I would always, always, always over filter your tank, 
over filtering your tank, you're never going to hurt anything. Under filtering, you'll know real quick if you're going to have problems because here's the problem with, with under filtration in your aquarium. If you decide to stock that thing moderately and or heavy, you're, you're going to be doing a lot more work. And for me, and I will say this in every single podcast as soon as I get a chance, if this hobby is taking me more time and costing me a boatload more money and a lot more stress, it is no longer a hobby. It's a job. It's got to be easier. And yes, I might have to outlay another 30, 40 bucks for an extra filter, but that 30 or 40 bucks is going to last me at least a few years outside of a few things I need to add to it for filtration, right? It's going to save me a buttload of time when I'm doing my water changes. It's going to lessen the amount I had to change a lot of times. So over filtering always going to be better than under filtering there. So I always encourage you if you want to stock it heavier and you feel like you can and your fish are going to get along, just throw some more filters in there. Um, it, it's I say that with some hesitancy because I'm thinking to myself, someone will be like, well, that guy said I could I could just put bigger more filters on there. I've got you know, all these humongous fish in a 40 gallon breeder. I'm not really saying that. I'm just saying if you happen to put a little bit more fish in there to just keep it a little bit more under control. That's all I was trying to get across. <laughs> all right. And your last, last part of the nitrogen cycle. All right. We talked about ammonia, got broken down by some good bacteria, broke down in the nitrate. Now we had another good bacteria come in there. Break down the nitrite. Now we got nitrate, last part of it. This is the least toxic um, parameter of the whole nitrogen cycle. It's really, I don't like to keep high nit. Well, I don't want any high nitrates on any of my tanks typically above 50. So that's relatively low if you're testing it on the scale of uh, the API kit or the, some of your test strips or whatever. 40, 50, I mean, 100 not really bad. I wouldn't really want it to be consistently that, but if it was 40 or 50, I think it's okay. That's probably as high as I'd want it to be. Uh, as far as it being toxic to fish, it's got to be in that red marker. What is that, 250, 500? I don't know what the number is, but it's up there. If that number is up there, that tells me a few things. One, you probably haven't changed the water in a long time, right? Because it's only getting removed a few ways. It's only getting removed by water. Uh, it's only getting removed by chemical. You put some sort of chemical filtration in tank or plants, right? It's the only time that's ever getting removed. So if you don't have those things in there, your nitrates are going to be high and you're going to have to do some water changes. And I'm sure you would know you're going to have some algae issues too. So for nitrates, if you have a high nitrate thing, make sure you're doing frequent enough water changes and enough volume, right? Um, uh, if you don't want to do that, add some plants to the tank and, or throw in some more chemical filtration that might be able to bind to it, right? So there's a few different options on dealing with nitrates. But generally speaking, I'm not as really concerned with nitrates at all you know i mean really a little bit but not a ton all right let's get to the last three parameters i wanted to talk about um ph kh and gh and normally i wouldn't talk about kh and gh but i i think it's important because so many people have different types of water across the country or maybe even in, in, in the world and i think it's important to use for a few people so let's first break down ph and what that is and generally you know trying to make this as simplistic as possible for our purposes as Aquarius, what we care about pH is knowing is our is our the pH of our water is it acidic, which is below seven, is it neutral, which is seven, or is it above seven, which is more alkaline, right? Or basic as some people call it. Now, where should our pH be for the fish in our aquarium? Man, that is a loaded question. That is a difficult question for me to answer because it's it depends. Um, and this is, goes back to my original, original thing I mentioned in the, in the beginning was for in the beginning when I said, know your source water, that's probably one of the most important things to know about your source water. What is your pH of your source? And is it different than your local stores or places you're buying fish from? And this is probably one of the only things that, that really it's, it's hard for me to give a real specific answer. But generally speaking, I try to keep I, – here's, here's why I have – let me tell you why I have hesitancy, and then you I'll, – I'll try to break it down from there. So sometimes you'll get fish in your local aquarium that might be wild caught, but you have no idea where those fish come from. You have no clue. You get in neon tetras, that could be a farm-raised fish here out of dang Florida because we do raise them here, and 
real massive scale volume. It's a big fish produced here in Florida, or you could be getting those wild out of the Amazon over there, right? You can get them with wild caught. And that could, that those fish are raised in different waters. It's just different. And that fish that had been caught in the wild has had to be adjusted all the way down to wherever those fish are at your local store. And that could be problematic. It doesn't mean it is. It just means it, it, it could be problematic. Uh, the ones here raised in Florida, I can tell you, they're, they're still raised in generally um, neutral-ish water. They're not really in super soft water, so they're a little bit hardier and a little bit easier to take care of. Now, they still raise neons uh, overseas. I'm sure there's a lot of people still import a ton of them in from Asia, and they're raised, depending on the country, they're probably neutral to somewhat soft. Or I'm um, not soft, not soft, but somewhat acidic. Sorry, it's getting late again. I'm getting a little tired. It's been a long day. So, um, so for our purposes, what does it matter for pH? What do we need to look at for our aquariums? It is going to depend a lot on those fish, but I'd say, oh, how do I say this without having to backtrack? <laughs> have to have to backtrack. Typically, if your fish are at least about a six point eight, all the way to an eight is probably a good range for most of your aquarium fish. And I'll say this is like the 80-20 rule. Most fish can do well in those parameters. Um, and most fish are kept in those parameters of pH, right? That's kind of the realm. If you're in Florida or you got hard water where you're at, you know, that's generally going to be where a lot of fish are already going to be spawned in, in those sort of harder conditions. And they're kind of used to it by then. I'll give you an example. Angelfish. You want to keep angelfish? I would imagine most of your angelfish are bred in harder water. We have, we're in here in Florida. We have super hard water. We spawn in right now. I did a, I, I was doing calculations with one of our breeders. We're, we're probably breeding and putting out for grow out maybe 6,000 to 8,000 angels a month. Um, every single one of them have been spawned in high pH, um, hard water to be completely frank. It, it can easily be done. Just you got to know what you're doing, but that's typically how it's done. And we don't have a we don't have a soft water system here. They're all spawned in hard water. So even though that fish is naturally a fish, you know, found in the wild in really softer water, lower pH, we don't have that problem here. So just an idea. So that's that's always been my um, reservation when telling talking about pH with fish because we don't. As an industry, we don't have a good grasp on where our fish come from when you're buying them from a consumer standpoint. And not to get on a soapbox about that, but that really bothers me because I like to know where my – when I look for stuff to buy, I, I want to know where it comes from. If I'm buying food from the grocery store, I just want to know where it comes from. I want to know how I just I want to know those things. At the very least, we should we should be we should want to know those things. So, you know, not to not to work on it too hard, but I will say I'm personally working on that as one of my goals this year before the year's up is to at least the fish that we sell. I want to have a tag on where that fish came from and is it farmed or wild caught? Uh, I'm really working on that on our website to kind of put that in perspective because I think it's important for people to know. And, and when they're trying to add fish to their aquarium, cause you might get a fish home and it was one of our wild caught plecos because we do we do buy a few a few wild caught fish here and there and you have the hard water and even though we have hard water and we've done a pretty good job of acclimating things, um, it just didn't go well for you and you're like dang that that was an expensive pleco, so I want I want to be for me, I think a little transparency to the industry would be helpful in helping people make good decisions about their fish keeping. So it's important for me to do that. So just, you know, not to be on a soapbox, but that's, that's important for me. So there's that. All right. So what do you do if your pH is incorrect? Well, it's sometimes, and I'll give you a couple ideas. Let's say you generally have harder water and it's, let's say it's at least over neutral pH, like over seven for a lot, most of your stuff. And you test your pH and it's below seven. And you're like, my, why is my pH low? Well, not all the time, but generally if your ammonia is high, it can have an inverse relationship where if your ammonia is high because ammonia, ammonia is acidic, it could mean your, P, your, your pH is lower. So sometimes I use that as an indicator to, to go test other parameters where that might be a problem. Um, 
And you also got to think about what other acidic type options in your tank are causing your pH to go down. If it's not normal for your source water, right? That's what I'm trying to say. Something that's, this is an uncommon problem you have. It's typically has to do with more waste in your tank. I've seen it a lot like that. It's probably the, it's probably the most common, I would say, where your parameters are too high. Your other, your nitro cycle is broken somewhere and it's very acidic in the tank because of it. And your pH is a little lower and that will go back to, and not that it's, it's the same repetitive answer, but a lot of it is just managing your, your stocking density in your tank and making sure your filtration is properly rated and doing water changes more frequently until that gets squared away. So to be kind of general, but not, that's a good way to deal with your pH to stay, to, to do that. Now, when does this not really apply? If you have more softer water, the problem you're you're going to have a lot of times is just having a stable pH. If you are up in the uh, northwest there, softer water is a lot of where your fish come from. So you're going to have to figure out a way to stabilize the water in your tank, which is the only reason I actually wanted to talk about general hardness and carbonate hardness, because for those people, it's going to matter a lot of times to stabilize your water. Because adding more fish and all that could really fluctuate and put your tank into all sorts of a doozy of swings. And you guys know this if you've kept fish in those types of waters before. So I just want to throw out a few ideas, a few things that might be helpful. And maybe you've already heard this or not, but I think this would be generally helpful. So let's kind of break those down. So KH, carbon hardness, what is it? What's our, you know, not to, again, trying to keep this as simplistic as possible. What would I measure it for and what is it used for? It, it Typically, the way I would describe it is this is going to determine if your water is going to have a bunch of swings, how much and how fast. So the least amount of carbon hardness you have, the more problems in your swings and your water quality you could see. And if you have more of it, it could help stabilize it out longer. So what does that even look like as far as measuring and stuff like that? And again, I'm trying to, th so it's measured two ways. So um, it's mostly measured, I think the API kits measure in degrees, if I'm not mistaken. And each degree is like 17 something, 17.5, 17 17.6 17 uh, ppm. That's the one I use as ppm parts per million. So generally speaking, I would like to see every tank at least at a four. And I believe that's around 70. Hold on. I'm doing the math over here on this side. Yeah, that's close enough. <laughs> so, so, um, I, I would like most tanks around 70, you know, most fish. Now, if you have those specialty fish, you shouldn't be doing the research and seeing, Hey, maybe they don't tolerate that. But for generally speaking, I think 70 is at least a minimum base to go by. You need something to help stabilize your water quality parameters. If you have that super soft water. So, Something I would just make sure you keep in mind if you're a new fish keeper up in those areas and you've got really soft water, that's something really to help stabilize it. Or actually, this would actually play in perfect. We have quite a few customers coming here and put in um, RO systems and they're just using straight RO water into their fish tank. Um, by the way, don't do that. It's pretty much not helpful for fish unless you're doing some other remineralization of the water to also help keep it stable. When you're putting stuff in the water, if you're taking everything out, you're going to have to wait. To ha you're going to have to add it back in. Um, so I, that's a good thing. I th I'm glad I remember that. I was, I thought I'd forget that. So again, like to keep it at, uh, at least at a 70 and a lot of, a lot of things that are going to want lower amounts of this, um, going to be things like, uh, Caradina shrimp, stuff like that. Some lower, lower pH, lower hardness fish. So just to reiterate, we have to use a stabilizer pH. So just something to keep, keep in mind when you're fish keeping, you're using, um, you have really soft water, really you know, like up there in the Northwest, or you're running a pure RO in your water. Um, you gotta think some of these things are required for a lot of the fishes, you know, bone structure and, uh, you might need it for plant development and you might need, um, oh, inverts need this stuff for their shells, right? So that's important. And then 
GH, which is just general hardness, is just basically telling you how hard or soft your water is. Again, still rated in degrees. Um, you know, generally, I, I still say you wouldn't want you want it to be about at least seventy ppm or four degrees. You know, our hardness here at the farm is like two fifty um, ppm, roughly. So pretty hard, pretty hard water for the most part. So. Um, just to keep that in mind for those people that are going to have to worry about swings in water and, and, and looking at that, right? Mm -hmm. So if you're looking to keep softer water fish and you measure your GH and you see your GH is super hard, you might want to find a way to deal with that, uh, make it softener. I would, first off, if you want to go from hard water to soft water, definitely put in a softener. You know, there's a few different ways you can do it. Uh, if it was me to make my life easier, I'd just put a softener and deal with it that way. Some people, will, if you want to run Caradina shrimp or, you know, stuff like that, they're going to put a full RO in and remineralize. There's a few ways to deal with it. But I would say for most fish out there in the hobby, you're not really going to have to do a whole lot of this. This was mostly just generate, just generally directed for people that already have super soft water that want to keep fish like a lot of the rest of us have. And a way to do that. Oh, I probably it'd probably be very helpful if I told you how to add it and buffer your pH a little bit, right? Uh, crushed coral. That's probably the cheapest and easiest way. Um, adding a bag, and I'd put uh, I'd buy a bag of crushed coral and get like one of those little mesh bags on Amazon, and I would add it to my aquarium. And I was trying to figure out how much. I've actually never, you know, because we have hard water here. I've never had to use crushed coral. So what I'd like you to do, and I and I have some ideas. I like to leave a comment if you use crushed coral in your filter or in your aquarium, what amount do you use for how many gallons of water and, and what does that bring your pH to? Um, what does that bring your carbon hardness to? However you're measuring it, whatever you want to, whatever parameter you want to give us, right? From just give us the, uh, the source water and then adding that, what did it turn it to? And then let us know in the comments below, but definitely adding crushed coral is going to help buffer your pH and keep it a lot more stable and stability for our aquariums is the number one thing that's super important, right? Having swings of all your water quality parameters is going to cause issues for your fish and stress them out. We don't want to stress them out. We want to enjoy the hobby. We want to enjoy our tanks. We want to enjoy our time with the fish and not make this a second job. So that's what I got for you today. So I hope you guys found this valuable. I hope this was good for you. If you did, it'd be very grateful. I'd be very grateful. You guys liked our podcast, leave us a rating on, uh, on one of the podcast channels you're listening to this on, uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel because I'm also doing this as a video. So if you want to see the video version of this, it'll be on YouTube as well. Um, just let us know what you think and leave some comments on how you uh, might do water quality at your at your place. How have you done to help your tanks? How have it, has it impacted your tanks? How are you testing these things? You know, what have you done that has helped you that may be help somebody else? And uh, I hope you guys comment, leave some stuff, let me know. And if you got questions, just leave a comment man i try, i like to i like to respond and uh be helpful so that's all i got for you hope you enjoyed it have a good time next week uh i will have on uh a really special guest uh talking about planet aquariums and i'm not gonna let you know who it is it's it's a secret but i'll let you know then all right have a good night